Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring after death communication. My guest is Marla Fries, who has worked for 25 years as a successful television and stage actress. She is also co-host with Whitley Strieber in his Dreamland radio program. She participates in teleconferences with physicist Tom Campbell, author of My Big Toe. She works as a psychic medium, appearing in cities across the country, presenting messages with Marla to small and large groups, educating people about intuition and connecting them with deceased loved ones. She is author of American Psychic, A Spiritual Journey from the Heartland to Hollywood, Heaven, and Beyond. Marla lives in Southern California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Marla. What a pleasure to be with you once again. Oh, Jeffrey, thank you so much for having me back. I love it. You were one of the entrants in the Bigelow Institute competition. I, I know you were not one of the finalists, but as far as I'm concerned, your essay is a winner. It is a winner with me, and I want to review it with our viewers because I think your experiences uh, say a lot of, well, let me put it this way, your experiences are valuable for everybody. Oh, thank you. You know what? I consider myself a winner being with you and also making the 205 cut. So whatever that means, I'm just glad to be here talking about this. Thank you. Your work, as you describe it, goes back to the, to the fact that you had, and we've talked about this in our previous interview, a very troubled childhood. Yeah, and I think that that's what really heightened my sensitivities to be ultra sensitive about my environment. And also, as Bruce Lipton would say, you know, change your environment. Your DNA is not the determining factor here. So I kept trying to change my environment in order to help myself heal. And also, you know, as you know, I had a former career as an actress. That part of my life was really how I saved myself with my mother. Because if I could pretend around her, or if I could get into that television set and be one of those, you know, people on one of the television shows or the commercials that she watched, maybe she'd love me and not hurt me. So that hypersensitivity, the willingness to have um, an imagination to believe, whether it was Santa Claus, ETs, God, those kinds of forces was, you know, was part of my reach out. I was reaching out for help. In addition to your problems with your mother, though, the neighborhood in which you live seemed to be troubled by murders. It's a very small town in South Central Pennsylvania. And we had, the, we had a farm outside of town. So we lived in town. There was a farm outside. And in that particular area, yes, there were three murders within a period of two years that basically altered my, altered my whole life. It was a classmate and two people that I had seen almost every week who were, who were murdered. It changed, it, it changed my whole perception of life. And I gather you began spontaneously experiencing, uh, some sort of contact with, uh, these individuals around their death, not just the individuals, but even the perpetrators. Well, what happened at that time, I was so young that I didn't recognize that this was an ability that I had. It was actually later on when I had a stalking incident that brought this whole conversation forward. You know, Jeffrey, I did not believe in talking to the dead. You know, I had had psychic things, psychic awarenesses, and I had had a voice that came to me to basically give me information before I was about to have a horse accident. 
So that voice basically saved my life, gave me information about how to prepare. I actually did have a terrible concussion with that, but that was my first inclination that was that there was something else, some other force, some other voice that was with me, that was guiding me. But it wasn't until the mid nineties that I, I had any contact with a deceased person, but it was that, um, it was, it was those particular murders that set me up to be curious. So I wasn't frightened. I became interested in homicide. I watched homicide television shows. And I think that that was the, that was the precursor to being okay with talking to dead people. One of the triggering events in your life, I think, is interesting. It had to do with a friendship you were developing with the famous anti-war activist, Jerry Rubin, whom I also knew. I had just become friends with Jerry, and we were part of this green movement at, um, it, was a con it was a convention, and he and his girlfriend and myself, we were planning a Thanksgiving together, and I was going to see him next week. And he happened to walk across Wilshire Boulevard a few days later and was hit by a car. And I ended up going into the hospital to see him. There were a few of us that were allowed in the ICU. And I saw him with a traction device on his head. And he had been um, basically operated on and had a suture from below his belly all the way up to his neck. And I really didn't know what to do. So I went back in the room and I, I was praying and asking, you know, what can I do? How can I help him? And I heard, Marla, I'm not coming back. And I thought, what's that? He's not talking to me. Who is that? I didn't believe in talking to the dead. Why would he talk to me? He's got lots of people in this room. Well, the next day he passed. So that was my first first touching with a deceased consciousness. It wasn't long after that, as I recall, that you sought instruction in mediumship with a, a very well-known uh, medium, James von Prague. Well, the, the interim story there is that that stalking incident that I mentioned earlier, oh. This opened up my, you know, it basically sent my antennas out of my head and they never went back down. But there was an incident in the stalking situation because I knew who this stalker was and he had tried to give me a couple of gifts. And in those gifts, I would try, there was a pair of gloves and I tried to put them on and something inside of me said, this isn't right. And I took them off. And then I got a jacket that he gave me and I heard Jeffrey it's not yours to wear. And I was like, what's that? That's not the voice that came to me as a child to save me in that horse accident. This sounded like a woman who was basically telling me, no, honey, that's not yours to wear. So to make a long story short, I ended up finding out that this gentleman was a con artist. I went public with it and then he threatened my life and I had to get law enforcement involved. But I went to the house that he said he'd been staying in. And that house happened to be, I, I think I changed the names in the book, Evie and Carl Greenberg, but they weren't living. I spoke with their daughter and apparently I said, well, this guy says he's been staying in this house. And the daughter basically told me, no, no, no one's staying. Nobody's buying the house. However, there was a young man that squatted in the house and took my parents' possessions and lived there for a certain amount of time. So those things that this guy was trying to give me were actually Evie Greenberg's clothes. And it was her that alerted me to this guy. And basically, that's how I ended up you know, going to law enforcement and in turn ended up working for law enforcement you know, to help them. So what we're dealing with at this point in your life are two different kinds of voices. One is sort of your own inner higher self warning you about danger. And, and the other voice is distinctly coming from another entity, not part of your subconscious mind. Correct. It, it was completely different than anything I'd ever imagined. And, you know, at that time, I really thought, oh, this is, I'm, I'm going crazy. This is really, 
this is a hard thing for me to deal with. So what happened is when you mentioned that other very famous medium, um, when you're stalked, your life changes in the way that is very, um, uh, how can I say? It's a different kind of harassment. You know, when you have a, when you have a perpetrator as a family member, when you have somebody that's violating you on a consistent basis, your boundaries are breached. This dynamic was something very unique. And I had to, I had to find a way to learn and to grow through this so that I didn't feel so crazy. So I, I pulled the sh shades down and didn't want to work my acting career. I mean, it was, I was working a lot, but I didn't care about it. And I turn on the TV and I see this guy with a mustache and blue eyes and he's talking to dead people. And I'm like, oh, that's a crock. Oh, here's a guy on a television show. I think it was called The Other Side on NBC. And I thought, well, that's interesting. It doesn't look fake. It doesn't sound fake. And these people seem to be looking as though that they are being, you know, really communicating with their deceased loved ones somehow. And at the same time, I got a call from a girlfriend that said, I can't get together with you because I'm going to Sedona with James Von Prague. And I thought, that's pretty interesting. I was watching him on television. And she said, well, you know, you should see him. He'll be, he, he will be at the hotel around the corner where you live. So I thought, why not go? I thought, hey, I could be an investigative reporter. Maybe I could out him. Maybe I could see that it's a fraud. And I just went and I had this attitude of, look, just, just open your heart and experience this. And that's what I did. And I came home deeply moved by the entire experience. And I prayed. And I said, please tell me what this psychic business is and this talking to the dead. And I had a dream that lasted for four hours of two words, Jeffrey, the center, the center, the center. And that was enough to make you crazy. But that center was something that I was alerted to. And my girlfriend called me and said, how did you enjoy seeing James? And I told her and she said, you know what? I'm best friends with his personal assistant. I'm going to call her and tell her about this. And Jeffrey, I was in James's house within the next five hours because James had been having the same dream about the center as I was. This is very interesting, Marla, because what we're looking at is a concatenation of many different kinds of events coming together to really shape your life to the person that you have now become. I, I, I gather we're talking about uh, your first encounter with James von Prague 20 years ago, I believe. Yes, yes, it was. And the, the dynamic of meeting him was great because we recognized this whole synergy about the, the center, which was literally in Brazil. So he said, you're going to Brazil with me. So I did do that. But he put me in a class and it was in that class that I made a decision because I've been pretty snarky about this whole idea about talking to the dead. You know, when our egos don't really understand what's going on and we want our egos to think we know more than we really do, we pretend like we know stuff. You know what I'm talking about. I hear from viewers who have that attitude all the time. Yeah, it's kind of like I was at a crossroads and I had, I had to make a decision. Was I going to stay snarky and opinionated and act like I knew what I was talking about? Or was I going to be curious? And I chose to be curious. And it was in his actual class that I had this remarkable experience talking to this deceased loved one that happened to be connected to someone in the room. So that's how I opened the paper. The Bigelow Institute essay starts out where uh, you are, I suppose you could say, like the model uh, in, in the class. You are uh, being an example of how a person can come in off the street, more or less, although by then you'd already had this synchronous dream with him, and uh, communicate with the departed. 
Yeah, and it was. As you, uh, what was that word that you used? Catacophony. What was that? <laughs> Yeah, concatenation, concatenation. And, and what I mean by that is, first of all, you lived in a neighborhood where several of your friends were murdered. You were being abused by your mother. Then you uh, got stalked and uh, had to deal with a, a very serious and dangerous situation with a stalker. Uh, you also developed a career as an actress, which opens up all sorts of subconscious abilities. So all of these things were happening to you. And, and then into your life comes uh, a famous medium, James von Prague. Yeah, yeah. And I traveled with him for about three years. We did Brazil, we did Sedona, I, and then I had a snarky attitude about UFOs, and those showed up. You know, it's like, it's... In a way, I have to say, you know, be careful what you're, you're, you're really opinionated about because it will come back and bite you in the, you know what. <laughs> but you studied with Von Prague and I'm sure uh, you were able to learn a great deal from him. Yeah, it was, it was right before he was famous, Jeffrey. So I got him when he was really, you know, he was really on top of his game before he was even famous. So we had we had the greatest time together and and it was it was quite wonderful and then his book came out and he became famous. And you transformed your career from being a professional actress to being a professional psychic much of which is documented in your book American Psychic. Yeah. You know, it was it was the day that my <laughs> it was the day that my agent called and said, "Where are you?" And I said, what do you mean? She said, you're not at your audition. And I said, oh, she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I was talking to a CEO of Toyota about his deceased father. And she said, you need to make a decision about what you want to do. And I said, you're right. It's not fair to you. It's not, it's not fair to me. And um, I left in 2002. Gave up a uh, very promising career in Hollywood. Yeah, I worked a lot, which was great. I mean, I had great fun. All the top shows of the 90s I did, all, all of the comedies. I didn't think that I would get stuck in comedy, but I was also had, you know, I also had a stage career and I let that go in 2000, anyway, 1999. The last show I did was playing Marlene Dietrich. So, yeah, left it all. And as a result of that, and as I think what you told me earlier is a follow-up from the uh, experience you had working with the police in relationship to this stalker, uh, the law enforcement agencies got wind of your abilities and you began to work with law enforcement. Yes, and I wanted to feel normal. And I thought, how am I going to feel normal? So I put that out there. I need to feel normal. I need to figure out how I'm going to make sense of all of this. And a flyer about Lynn Buchanan teaching controlled remote viewing crossed my path. And I went to Tempe, Arizona, and bam, that was it. He, he literally made me feel normal for the first time since I had been having this, this um, new, new world come into my consciousness. Now, Lynn has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud several times. In fact, I will link to uh, one of our previous interviews with him in case some viewers are curious. He's a person who went through the U.S. military remote viewing program. That's where he received his training, and he's become one of the premier trainers himself of, of remote viewing abilities. So, you studied with him. Yes, I sure did. And you know, I, I loved it. And he had me working on projects. And one of the things that I, I, I always regret this because I never spent enough time doing what we would call technical map dowsing. And we worked together. I would meet him at the airport before, you know, there was so much security at the airport and we would, we would work on cases. And, um, I would love it if we had the opportunity for him to show what the technical map dowsing really is. I would love to do that again with him because that was so much fun. And he taught me so much. And I, I had to move on because I had been working on a case that was, uh, an, an, a, was on an ongoing serial killer. 
and um, it became really challenging, and I took a break. I fell in love. I got married, but it was also I needed to focus on more of a connection to consciousness in deceased loved ones and helping people with that. But I love, I mean, you know, I go back and train with all different kinds of remote viewing. It's still part of my soul and I love it. And um, I'm forever grateful for Lynn's help. Since we've now talked about your training in mediumship with James von Prague and your training in remote viewing with Lynn Buchanan, you're in a unique position to be able to compare these two approaches. I think that it's fascinating when, when you open up your consciousness to the idea that there's something greater and you become a beacon. It's kind of like, oh, there's another one. We'll give her some more information. <laughs> I think that it was also going to Monroe because Monroe opened that pathway. So I'd been going for 10 years and the binaural beats balancing that corpus callosum and holding us in that space so that we could have these extraordinary experiences. And it's not just dead people. It's connecting with other consciousness too. Excuse me, Marla, but you mentioned the Monroe Institute in, in Virginia. Based on the work of Robert Monroe, the author of the classic books on journeys out of the body. So, in addition to your training in mediumship and remote viewing, you basically also receive training in uh, what some people like to call out-of-body experience. Yes, and I only had one out-of-body experience that felt like it was out of body, where I rolled out of my body, looked at myself, and then took off. So most of my work was really just leaving and having sending my consciousness someplace else, which became very helpful when I was working for law enforcement by bilocating to where a murder was happening, becoming the murderer, um, interfacing as the victim, and doing all of that work. What I'm getting from what you just said, that, that last sentence of yours was so rich, uh, it suggests that when you are flexible enough within yourself, your consciousness can go anywhere. Yeah, because I really was curious. I, you know, I had a, <laughs> I had a friend from college bring me my first crime scene photo. And that was back in 94, when this all started just happening. And I held that photograph, Jeffrey. I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, he said, you know, he called me, he said, I heard you become some sort of psychic. And I'm like, I don't know, whatever. I don't know whether I can help you or not. And he had this really important death in his hometown. It was, an, it was a cold case that had been going on, you know, for years. So he brought me this photograph and I held it and boom, just like that, Jeffrey, I became the victim in that grassy area in the town where she was murdered. And I gave details about where things were. And in the paper, I basically let, let my friend, um, Rick Coleman basically tell that story about what I was able to do when he brought me that photograph and how it was, it was important for him as he was being in his own investigative reporter, but it got everybody else interested. He wasn't saying, Oh, I've got a psychic in my pocket and I've got information here, but he was looking at this 30 year old cold case from a different perspective. And yes, it was helpful. And yes, they did something with my information, but it was just the most remarkable experience. I'd never had that before where I became the victim, saw the perpetrator, knew the perpetrator, talked about him, described him. And then the last thing that happened was he hit me as the victim with a piece of wood. And I was like, what the, you hurt me. And there was a tooth in the grass. And that tooth was actually found by one of the detectives. 30 years after the crime had been committed. Well, I had that awareness. He had found that, um, he had found that tooth within that framework of time because he saw it and put a, a pencil in the ground. But the fact that I would 
access that information for mm. my friend. And that's another thing, Jeffrey. It's like there's no reason that I think can think of to do this work unless you're going to help somebody with it. Unless you're going to bring forth some love, some healing, whether it's clues from law enforcement, whether it is um, it's it's to help the, you know, comfort the grief stricken, whether it is to help heal personal relationships, like with generational trauma. You know, when I, when I read your paper, it was that whole Fisher Hoffman situation. And I was thinking, oh my God, that's the generational healing that I have grown to do in my own work in, mm -hmm. in these last 10, you know, 15 years. We better step back since you mentioned the Fisher Hoffman training and explain it a little bit for our viewers. Would you like to do that or shall uh, I? No, you do it, please. <laughs> oh, oh, all, all right. Since you bring it up, you're referring to one of about uh, 25, I call them white crow examples that I wrote about in, in my essay for the Bigelow Institute competition. And this is a case where a tailor named Robert Hoffman in Oakland, California, who had been a psychotherapy patient of a, um, I believe his name was Siegfried Fischer, a, a psychotherapist who had died. And one day, Hoffman is in bed in the middle of the night and he wakes up and he sees Fischer standing over his bed. And Fischer takes him through a, a psychotherapeutic exercise and then tells him that I now I'm on the other side and I see my work as a psychotherapist is incomplete. I have a whole new theory of psychotherapy. I've just taken you through the process and now you, a tailor, are going to introduce this form of psychotherapy to the world. And Fisher or Hoffman, the tailor, said, oh, how am I supposed to do that? I'm, a, I'm just a tailor. And Fisher said to him, don't worry, doors will open for you. And that was the birth of what came to be known as the Fisher Hoffman process. And currently, even today, decades later, it's being taught as the Hoffman quadrinity process. But, uh, and, and I show in my essay a very well known psychologist, Charlie Tart, went through the training and described it, or the, I should say the therapy. Uh, it was offered as a training program in a seminar, and he went through it, and he said it was the most powerful experience he had encountered in his vast experience of looking at altered states of consciousness for which he's famous. And in my essay, I pointed out that although we have no way to prove that uh, the deceased psychotherapist Fisher actually taught all of this to the Taylor Hoffman from a pragmatic point of view when you have someone like Charles Tart saying it's the most effective process he'd ever been through. We have to take it seriously. Of course. And that's, that's one of the, the wonderful aspects of consciousness who isn't finished on this earth plane getting a hold of us and translating, transforming, downloading all of this information. I mean, the same thing happened with um, The Course in Miracles. You know, that was a channeled piece of information. So what we're looking at is ongoing education. And we have to, you know, I'm interested in teamwork here. You know, we have a lot of people out there that have the same kinds of experiences that I've had. I'm sure that there's other experiencers like myself who, who wrote essays about this for, for the, um, for the Institute. But I was so thrilled to do it because I felt, look, I'm just my own laboratory. I'm going to show what it's like being a lens for this information and how it comes through. And it really is. There's a whole, there's a whole it's all about love. Let's just put it that way. Whether it's love of, of your family or helping law enforcement or, as I said before, helping the grief stricken, bringing comfort, giving medical information, all of this stuff. I really wanted to make sure that I had a voice in this conversation of, look, you guys, 
I'm just one of those people that you research and you aggregate and you put them up and etc. But I really wanted to make people understand that I had no interest in this and, and I made a decision to do something about it. And as you said, I became, um, a, a, a systematic, synergetic, um, one thing after another, including looking at the science of this. So for the last 10 years, enter science. I started looking around and wanted to find out, just like um, I believe it was Willis Harmon talking to you in, in another one of your videos in your essay, which I loved. And he's basically saying, we need a framework for this. And that's what I thought I needed, Jeffrey. It's kind of like I was going crazy, had to get help with, you know, the military, had to get help with Von Prague. And, and I sought help out from a lot of different people. And of course, Monroe, but it was a framework, enter science. Mm -hmm. So many of the other people that were winners, actual winners that got some cash in hand for, from the essay contest were extrapolating all of this. And my work with Tom Campbell, who I interviewed on Dreamland, on Whitley Strieber's Dreamland, because I had gone to see him in Costa Mesa. Here was a guy that had trained with Bob Monroe and was actually doing the science um, experiments of what Bob Monroe was doing. And he developed the Hemisync program along with Dennis Mennerich about this. So here's Tom Campbell, a NASA defense guy who did all this stuff with Bob Monroe. I want to listen to him. Of course, it made my head hurt and I didn't understand, you know, reality and, or, or, or vir, vir, virtual reality or simulation. So I had no dog in the fight. I just wanted to learn. And you've really been a serious student of the field since, since your encounter with Von Prague. Yes, I have been. You know, whether it's other mediumship work, whether it's remote viewing, whether it's, it's aspects of rem remote viewing, like with Marty Rosenblatt and the Applied Precognition Program, all of that, it's that to me is you've got to go and you've got to, you, you've got to embrace the opportunity for the education. Well, one of the insights I'm getting from our conversation, Marla, is that you experience these realities as a sort of a, a web, an interconnected web, and it's all related to consciousness. And as you say, really, it's all related to love. So whether we're talking about map dowsing or the afterlife, it's not as if these are necessarily in separate silos. They are all a part of a, a unified experience. Yeah, and, you, and it's, it's data data, whatever you want to call it. It's information, right? Everything that we have brought into this, it's accessible in some way. And I think that this larger system, whether you want to call it the source or the force or God or a larger consciousness system, or Marty calls it the, um, the collect universal collective consciousness, this is facilitating all of this. And I think that that is remarkable for us who are doing it, but we're also teaching people how to do this. You know, when I, I met, um, when I met Campbell, I was like, well, this is great. What, this is great for me because I get the science of this, but what is it doing to the science people? What is his information doing? And he decided to turn around and start teaching left brain people how to access and do the things that we do, Jeffrey. What I was doing, dead people, past life regressions, Brian Wise, all that stuff, all of the information that we in the paranormal world, and you and I both agree about, we're just trying to make it normal because everybody can taught, be taught how to do aspects of this. And it seems... Uh, as best I can tell, what really convinces people isn't to hear a scientific theory explained to them. It's to have a personal experience. When people discover that this is something they're able to do for themselves, it no longer becomes a question of, well, are the skeptics right or wrong? Uh, there's no longer any need to doubt. Right. 
Well, and that's where your paper, you know, that's what gave you the big job of being the big winner of that paper because you detail all of this. You've had myriads of years of, of videotapes having experts talk about all of this. And in the analogs of time, <clears throat> whether these, um, whether these papers are published and put in, in museums or, or, you know, what are those called? Libraries. <laughs> <laughs> libraries or whatever, or that it's all over the internet. People need to read these and see what's going on because why keep us stupid? Well, and that's one of those real serious points that there's a cost for our civilization when we remain ignorant about the reach and power and nature of our own consciousness. Well, I'm going to bring this in because um, your, another part of your, your essay is about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And I, mm. I want to share this interesting aspect because we've been talking about other professionals coming and talking and giving downloads. So I'm, I'm just going to grab this and take a look at it for a second. But, okay. But, you know, I have to look at my own book to read this. But uh, when I was at Monroe, Monroe, I went to a place that was like a home for me. And the first person that I encountered was a guy that I recognized, but I didn't know who he was. So I walk into this beautiful sort of cabin in the woods and I go, Yoo-hoo! And I hear, I'm over here. And he said, I'm John Mack. John Mack was in my personal house on the other side in some sort of meditation that I was doing. Me, me, okay, you're in a meditative state. And I did not know who he was. So he basically says, I'm here to prepare this place for you to help you integrate your process with awareness. Therefore, you can take from here and translate this on earth to assist others. And he gestures to these bookshelves and he says, okay, this, these are books on planets, stars, extraterrestrials, and UFOs. And I say, UFOs? And he said, yes. UFO means unidentified family of origin. The credible part of the UFO consciousness is about establishing contact in a soul and mind space to accumulate the knowledge of other worlds, other life forms, and other galaxies. We connect with them for learning and hold all things of love and similar loyalties. This is your family or part of your family of origin. That blew me away. And just within minutes, I'm in another room and I'm in a big hall where the woman is dragging this, um, this chalkboard in and she's writing on it saying death equals life eternal, life before the physical. And she turns around and she says, I'm Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and we have work to do. So she basically gives me this whole lecture about life after death, the work that we have to do. And she basically says, look, I want you to go to my second book. He, she says, yeah, go to my second book where I talk about, um, in, it's in chapter 13, and use your interpretation of this to assist others. Your communication with those on the other side helps people understand that life is eternal. I didn't know what her books were. I had to go home, order them, and they are there. But it's basically, we have more work to do. Well, that's a very good lesson to share with our, our viewers, because I think everyone listening to this video or watching it uh, right now uh, should understand that that's a message for them. We all have more work to do. Exactly. So as a team, and that's what you keep doing, you keep pulling us all together. And it's not about this person needs to be right or have the answer here. This is what, this is what I just don't understand about any of any kind of community around this where people ride the fence about materialism or, or embracing what is really happening in their lives. I know that people need to make money, but my gosh, here's an opportunity. And the contest was a, a synergetic opportunity for people to bring the most important information in and share it with the world. And I'm just thrilled that you wanted to talk about my paper. So 
Well, your paper is an outstanding example of uh, the wonderful work being done by people who unfortunately weren't amongst the 29 finalists. There were like 240 entries, and uh, I thought your paper was just outstanding, Marla. And I hope we find ways to make it uh, available widely for people. Wow. Thank you so much for saying that. Well, I was, I was on fire, you know, and you know how long it takes to put together an essay like that. But I loved it. And I really, boy, I get really emotional when I think about this. It truly is the essence of who we are. And we just do what we do because we must. Well, beautifully put, Marla. I'm very touched by your passion and your dedication for this work. And I'm also delighted to let our viewers know that we have another conversation in store. We haven't even begun to talk about some of the work you're doing uh, helping people to interact with this universe of collective consciousness in which we're all embedded. So there's much more uh, coming in the, in the future. Thank you. Yes, I can't wait to discuss that with you. Well, Marla Fries, once again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for our time together today. Thank you, Jeffrey. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.